with my business partner, Aaron, who I believe is going to go back there, Aaron, tonight. And um, about um, God, 2003, we found ourselves, um, coincidentally, after working together many years in New York, at USC together, um, getting um, advanced degrees. <laughs> so we um, were approached by the Norman Lear Center, which is a um, think tank, a entertainment related think tank in California related to USC. Um, about producing some research um, focused on fashion and copyright. Aaron has spent many years working at music, and we wanted to take a look at um, music and fashion, and how both those industries, one being a copyright maximalist, the other being a copyright minimalist, um, how, they, how they relate to each other in terms of um, the creative process, but also how they differ in terms of the legal structure and the organizational structure of those two those two industries. So we produced this research that's published by the Lear Center, um, and Adam and I had so much fun working together again after all those years that we started a company called Big Out Research, um, and we consult with um, a variety of corporations. So um, that's how I ended up here talking about this topic, um, and um, I wanted to. Oh yeah. He... <laughs> Apparently, Aaron assigns it now as required reading in his classes um, to his students. So um, we, um, I wanted to, to start off with a very, very quick presentation, just because um, I know everyone in this room is very familiar with the fair use and copyright law, but I'm thinking maybe not as familiar with how um, fashion works. So I just want to give you some background and some, um, some context to start off the conversation. So, um, Basically, what we've seen is that um, fashion has historically been denied copyright protection, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, so it, it's one of the reasons, is, let's look at it historically, and I'm only going to start with the mid-18th century. Um, pretty much ever since you know, man took off his loincloth and put on something else, fashion has been used to, um, to signify a number of social, um, social signifiers, class, gender, um, position, hierarchy, uh, religion, and um, you know, in the Middle Ages, a, um, if someone took a nobleman's livery, they were forced to wear this coat of arms and colors. Um, sumptuary laws in the Elizabethan age actually um, prevented um, people from wearing the clothes of noblemen. They um, believed that the entire moral fabric of society would be um, rendered <laughs> asunder if, um, if the lower classes were wearing the clothing of the upper classes. So um, there's a lot of law that, went, that happened um, before the mid-18th century, but in the mid-18th century, we had a rising middle class that could suddenly um, afford to buy fashion. Um, we also had changes in textile technology, so um, mass production became closer to reality. Um, in the mid-19th century, we had the House of Work, which uh, Founded, which was essentially the first couturier, the first, um, the first time that a designer, an individual, was associated with a creative product in fashion. Um, towards the end of the 19th century, we had mass production, which meant that uh, middle class could buy essentially knockoffs of high end couture. Um, in the beginning of the 20th century, we had um, what were considered authorized and unauthorized reproductions being sold in the US. Um, mainly through catalogs, a Sears catalog, things like that. Um, so we had this democratization starting to happen in the early 20th century. And um, we also had what we think of as you know, the, the high end of fashion um, become established. So Chanel, Dior, Balenciaga, all these names that we're still familiar with today were founded in the 20th century. Um, around 1933, there was um, this first attempt to really protect fashion in an organized way, and that was with the Fashion Originators Guild of America. Um, it basically required registration for designs. Uh, manufacturers had to um, abide by this, or they were blacklisted, essentially, and the FTC stepped in and said, this is illegal, <laughs> this is a violation of antitrust. And by 1941, in the Supreme Court case, the Fashion Originators Guild was dead. Um, and then, Things kind of progressed along until the 1960s, and that was really where we hit a watershed moment in fashion. We had Hollywood, we had rock and roll, we had youth culture. We had all these um, cultural factors suddenly taking, um, taking over in a way that 
fashion was no longer top down. It wasn't, you know, designers in Paris or New York or Milan telling everybody what they should wear. Suddenly the kids were all right. They knew um, you had this uh, bottom up um, direction for, for fashion where designers were taking inspiration from the street and from kids who um, didn't care what designers were telling them to do anymore. And um, so you had this destabilization of couture and um, you also had an industry that is um, highly stratified, but also highly diverse. Um, it's not an oligopoly in the way that you find in other culture industries like music and movies. You have a lot of um, large designers or a lot of small designers, and um, it's an incredibly um, non-monopolistic industry. What that has led to is a lot of copying, um, a lot of knockoffs, and sometimes counterfeiting. And um, to, to address that, um, some of the um, higher end um, designers have um, really been pushing legis legislation to have copyright. Um, they have historically been protected through patent and trademark, um, but not copyright. And one of the main reasons for this is that fashion is um, considered utilitarian. It's considered functional. And functional objects in the US um, aren't really afforded copyright protection in the same way that art or sculpture or um, weirdly the design of um, um, boats <laughs> are protected in the US. So um, from 2006 on, we have multiple legislative, legislative attempts to, um, to protect copyright. And I'm, I know we're going to get into that in the discussion. Um, but a picture says a thousand words, right? So um, this is probably one of the most famous um, examples of um, copying. Um, basically, um, the head designer of Balenciaga, Nicolas Gasquier, probably butchering his name, um, in, I believe it was 2002, um, produced a vest. It's the one on your right. Um, that was almost an exact knockoff of a uh, vest designed by a man named Kai Sing Wong. He was a fashion designer in San Francisco. He was of Chinese American descent, and he had died about a decade earlier of age-related disease. So um, I only bring that up because um, there was no one around to sue. <laughs> um, he pretty much had license, um, even if it was not um, technically illegal. There was no one. Around. He thought. Well, we don't really know what he thought, but. Um, there wasn't an estate really to sue um, him for, um, you know, he went after an obscure, dead Chinese American designer. Um, and it's almost a, um, you know, stitch by stitch replica of this um, vest. When he was found out, he was pretty <coughs> upfront about it. His, his response was, I did it, yes. And not only that, I'm very flattered that people are looking for my sources of inspiration. Um, he this was not apologetic at all. He was actually quite flattered that people were actually investigating where he uh, was getting his ideas from. Um, when I was working on the uh, research we were producing, we went to a man named Cameron Silver who owns a um, high-end vintage boutique in Los Angeles called Decades. It's um, when you see um, uh, celebrities on the red carpet or at the Oscars wearing like a 1930s you know, couture dress, it usually comes from Cameron. This is a man who knows his fashion. Um, and when we talked about it, he said, the incident doesn't die. When Gaspier passes away, his obituary will mention two things. The bag he designed is a very famous Balenciaga bag that they are very litigious about protecting, and the Kaisik scandal. Um, doesn't mean that he's not going to do it again. Um, on your left is a um, vest, a jacket, a leather jacket that was produced by a company in the 1960s um, called East West Music Instruments, I believe is the name. And um, they were famous for producing these sort of rock and roll uh, jackets for Janis Joplin and a couple of others. And they go on eBay for anywhere from $1,000 to $5,000. But um, the company's out of business now. Again, there's no one there to sue. <laughs> and um, in the middle there, you have his version of it. Um, which then got replicated by Urban Outfitters for about a $300 price point and sold out very quickly. So you have, you know, sort of that, that continuum there of um, this um, vintage jacket into high end down to the low end. Um, both 
the bridge sold out. And we see it happening again and again and again. Um, this is my first, and hopefully not my last, presentation that I put together that talks about Jessica Simpson, but um, <laughs> she, um, she has a very successful shoe line, um, and you'll see here, it's almost, you know, an exact replica of a Christian Louboutin shoe. Um, hers retail for, you know, about a hundred bucks, those retail for probably about a thousand bucks. Um, Ivanka Trump, um, I love that always, like, non-celebrities have shoe lines, but um, she had a shoe a few years ago that was very similar to a Derek Lamb um, shoe, again, almost stitch by stitch. Um, Kate Middleton, um, everyone was, you know, so um, in love with her wedding dress um, until they found out that it looked very, very similar to a wedding dress by, um, worn by a woman named Isabella Orsini, who's uh, Italian royalty, um, two years earlier. So um, these are very, very similar dresses. Um, another famous case, um, Yves Saint Laurent and Christian Louboutin um, are embroiled in a legal battle over the red sole. Um, the sole of Louboutin's company is that red sole underneath the shoe. Um, it's an instantly identifiable signifier of Christian Louboutin and he has claimed that he owns that color. Um, <laughs> that red belongs to him. Um, and I think is that trademark issue? Um, yeah, probably. He has the trademark that they scared horribly child. Um, and I think the trial is over and they're deciding, um, they're deciding. Yeah, deciding, um, this, yeah, they're deciding who wins here, who owns red. Um, and then we have another trial that's going on right now, Gucci versus Guess, um, where Gucci is claiming that um, Guess's shoe is way too similar with their interlocking G's as well as the um, patterns and style here. So we're all going to let the, um, the panel introduce themselves briefly. Hopefully, I didn't have too much time. But um, just a few things that we do want to think about. You know, is there a need for protection in this industry? If there is, can a balance be struck between the need for protection and um, the uh, desire to allow um, an industry to continue to thrive creatively because this is an industry that hasn't really been hurt too much by, um, by a lack of copyright. And then, you know, what, what does make fashion a unique form of cultural production that uh, makes it, you know, dissimilar from music or media or, you know, journalism, what we talked about earlier? And um, are there lessons that we can learn from what's happened in fashion? Um, and both the industry as well as the community, because those are two different things when we're talking about fashion. Um, can other creative industries learn from them? So I'm going to let the um, Katie introduce herself, and then um, also we'll get into some of these questions. So I already introduced myself, essentially. My name is Katie Tasker. I work at Public Knowledge. And when we touch on fashion copyright issues, I tend to be the go-to person. Um, I've been the person following the ID3 which I know that Ilsa will talk about more in depth. Um, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I do outreach. Uh, this is more from personal desire to get involved in this because I think that uh, there are a lot of misguided efforts to place copyright on the fashion industry that I think would be a detriment to the fashion industry. Um, and it's sort of, I don't want to see them shoot themselves in the foot. <laughs> so, Good afternoon. Um, I came all the way from California to aggregate you as part of our team to prevent any future uh, discussion of IDPPA. I will start by framing what we're doing, but first let me tell you a little bit about the California industry. It's the largest in the country, surpassing in employment in New York by about 60,000 employees. We do not make red carpet merchandise. So the stuff that you see at the Academy Awards is not made in California. What's made in California is generally what you see in the public domain, what you see in the TV shows, what you see in front of you on the street, what you see in the general 
retailing world is that which is coming from California. It's usually not brand made. We have very few major brands, but we have over 7,000 companies that employ many, many designers. And 85% of what comes through our ports is made elsewhere. So it's not a manufacturing industry as much as it is a service industry, and that goes to New York as well. That's a whole other subject. But that is how fashion works today, and it's called speed. Uh, there. This is the outline. We're going to define the terminology and then talk about the new bill. And then there are some very, very current fair trade issues that are coming up. Trademark, patent, copyright, counterfeit, trade dress. Anything you see conceivably falls in one of these five categories. Anything you see in the street. Here's your trademark. You know what these companies are. You know who they are. And if you don't, and you're wearing something that has this mark on it, and it's not that company, then it's counterfeit. This is a patent. It's very rare that patent is in the apparel business, because construction there's nothing new under the sun. Now in this particular case, not your mother's jeans, did it crisscross a uh, flap and was able to get a patent, but it is very, very rare in the apparel industry. Copyright. Now this is a little bit dicey. There are many, many restrictions of copyright in the apparel industry, and we call it vexatious litigation. You have companies that do not design anything but they make a screen of a print that is in public domain, copyright it for $40, and then sue anyone who uses it after it's been in public domain, a polka dot, a cherry, a daisy. And we have that throughout the industry. It's called vexatious litigation. But copyright refers to the pocket of a gene, not just the trademark. Also, something like the Burberry plant is not only a trademark, but it's also a copyright. All those prints that were on the Ed Hardy look that is no longer a part of fashion, that's a copyright. <laughs> counterfeit is illegal. Counterfeit is an issue with the U.S. Treasury Department. And these are the fakes and the reals, and they usually come from overseas. But that is a company that is going for the look and the trademark that they don't want. Now we get to a very gray area, trade dress. Trade dress is when you're looking at something you know from whom it's derived, and it doesn't have a logo. The blue box of Tiffany doesn't need to say Tiffany. The bottle of Coca-Cola doesn't need to say Coca-Cola. And a Chanel jacket, although it may be a knockoff, is still considered a Chanel-type jacket. That's trade dress. The problem with the Red Soul fight is that they didn't go for trade dress. And they may lose, Louboutin may lose on this one, because they didn't go for trade dress and they didn't define the red. They could have defined it. There's a whole series of colors called Pantone colors that you can pick a color number and you can trademark or use that color as your own. But they didn't do that. So they, and by the way, it's in, um, it's in appeal now. Uh, Louboutin already lost and it's in appeal. So we get to the new one, a new county heard from. Let me tell you the background of this. Uh, two of Senator Schumer's constituents, Harvey Weinstein and Barry Dilla, who are married to designers, Diane Furstenberg, Georgina Chapman, and Marquesa, decided that they had enough. They were creative geniuses, and they found knockoffs. And both men supported Senator Schumer, and went public in Women's Red Daily was saying, we have paid for this bill to be passed. I have the quote. The bill will is now in its fifth version. The background is 
that knockoffs under current law are legal. They are not considered counterfeit. They do not have the label of the originating designers. The proposed law states that a copy to be infringed may be substantially identical. Nobody really knows what the hell that means, but that's what it says. So similar in appearance as to be mistaken from the protected design with a three-year protection. Now, mind you, fashion moves at the speed of 10 weeks. In 10 weeks, it's in and it's out. That's the sequence at retail. However, and this is the big however, no registration or copyright for infringement is required. The Copyright Office has not changed its IT since the 70s. They have no room and no way to take on copyright, copyrights for designer brands. Don't forget, each designer makes over 100 styles five times a year. Copyright office couldn't handle that. This law says nothing is required. Someone graduating, being graduated from the Rhode Island School of Design can say, I did that first, and send a letter, and the game is on. There is no research available for who said what was copyrighted or what was done first. And garment design and pattern making has been considered useful, as has been pointed out. Pattern making, a useful art. There is just so much you can do to get into it, to make it fit, where are the bosoms, where do you work it, and how do you get it from a size 8 to a size 16. Now, costume design is something else. One of a kind, Bob Mackey's on share, are not made for public consumption. But when you design a garment, you have to make it for public consumption. Here's another useful article. Are we going to be getting a proliferation of lawsuits because the Bentley looks like the Chrysler? And this lawsuit is waiting to happen. As was shown, not only was the Countess, I think she's Countess or Zini, had the dress, but it happened to have been knocked off. The wedding was April 29th. By May 9th, it was knocked off by a British designer, and by May 7th, it was on the cover of Women's Wear Daily. It was in the Countess, but the funny thing about it is, from 1991, there it is from Brooklyn, from Kleinfeld's in Brooklyn. <laughs> Is that 1991 or 19? No, 1991. What is original? What is original? And as someone who has been there historically, I can tell you that nothing is in the way of garment design made from a pattern. Diane von Furstenberg, one of the major proponents of this bill, says she created and invented the rap dress. Well, there it is in the 60s. There was hers in 1975. She brought it back in 2009. But yet, Claire McCardell had it at 6.95. It was a sportswear tradition in the 40s. So the wrap dress in its incarnation, how do you say, I did it first? Originality, the other designer that testified in Washington uh, as to how much money he lost by having knockoffs was Narciso Rodriguez, who designed the wedding dress for the unfortunate Carolyn Kennedy. Unfortunately for him, I then sent a photo along with a bow pattern from the 60s. Now, the dress in and of itself, is it original? I love this phrase from Saint Laurent. Over the years, I have learned what is important in a dress is the woman who wears it. The dress is a basic slip dress on the bias. And he whipped that out in Congress and said there were 5,000 copies and I should have had a royalty. And we're saying, why? We now have the third proponent in front of Congress, Vera Wang, who has made a trip to every one on the Judiciary Committee, 
saying that her garments should be protected. Her wedding dresses should be protected. However, the new Vera Wang for Coles, they had no problem knocking off Prenzo Shola, Thackney Misha, and Valentino when they put her brand on shoes and handbags. Where is the substance in all of this? Is she only protected for one garment, one wedding dress, or does she want protection for everything that is in her name? And where is Bagley Mishers of Prada Omar Jacobs protection in this? This is the process. Lorenzo Shola has just finished testifying in Congress because Target knocked him off, knocked off his bag. And his bag is 1500 or 1600 and the Massimo Messenger was a problem for him. He brought both garments to Congress. However, the evolution of the Mulberry Alexa bag from 2003, then you did Parenzo Shola, and then Mulberry is back again with 2010. This is how fashion works. It's back and forth and back and forth. It's called merchandising. And then what do we do about this, ladies, that we all see in, well, we're having a manicure. <laughs> <laughs> and the magazines. And there isn't a magazine that doesn't have, can you spot the knuckle? Is this going to be illegal? And under the, the way the law is written, absolutely. You'll never see this again, the law passes. So the fundamental flaws of IDPPA, it's now IDPPA. And the reason the third P is in there is because they put in the word piracy. And they put in the word piracy so that other uninformed legislators would think, oh, we're all against piracy. But this has nothing to do with piracy. This enables cop designers to claim copyrights over styles that they didn't invent. They don't mean to but they don't know that it was done before. Infringement claims would only target US companies. There is no point in trying to sue a Chinese company, Zara, Mango, H&M, Topshop, Benelton. Those are all offshore retailers. There's no point going after them. This would only be targeted against US retailers and US designers. The lending institutions have a problem with this because if something gets a letter of infringement, it comes right off the retailer's shelf and goes right back to the manufacturer. Where's the money? And of course, judges become the arbiters of fashion taste and we've all seen what they wear under the ropes. <laughs> Not to be defined. So here we have the, what's happening now just to define counterfeit and piracy. The three biggest things in counterfeit are music, movies, and brand name clothing. And unfortunately, they have lumped all these three things together in consideration of future laws. However, in the case of counterfeit, 25% of the people who buy it knew it to be illegitimate. They just wanted to wear that brand. And 73% said it's easily available. Here's a situation of, a, of real versus fake. The fake Ugg shoe says made in Australia. Uggs are made in China. So that in order to give it authenticity, they put the made in Australia on, and it was caught at ports. And the current actions, and that's the Combating Online Infringement and Counterfeit Act Rope Piracy. This is the target of the new bill that was just put down, the SOFA and the PIPA. These kind of websites that actually sell counterfeits, not replicas, not as seen as, not imitations of, but actually sell counterfeits. One was Stop Online Piracy and the other Protect Intellectual Property Act. And the reason I say, show these as part of the fashion statement is because we are concerned that we wound up, wind up in this web. 
because these will try and come back before Congress as well. So now I'd like to conclude with another scary new issue for free trade, fair trade, and all of these other issues that you are so vehemently involved in. China has started as of August of last year freezing trademarks. It started with Castell Winery, which is a small winery in London, in England. The, they froze the name because there was another company in China that phonetically had the name Castell. They have now frozen Michael Jordan from being a brand in China because there is a chain of retailers with 5,700 retail stores using Michael Jordan's image. And I can't even pronounce it, Chow Dun is the name of the, brand, of the, name of the retail stores. Chow Dun with Michael Jordan's image. Now we go to Hermes. They just lost the case. Hermes, that venerable French brand, is no longer a brand in China because someone phonetically translated Hermes. Amashi is Hermes. And now, just in April, Chevis Regal. They don't recognize Chevis Regal because the court said it was not well known in China. So whoever translated Chevis Regal phonetically into Chinese now can use the, che the Chevis Regal brand. Go fight City Hall in China. <laughs> we are very much concerned that this will translate into US brands like Guess, like BCBG, like Land's End, like anything else. So we are telling all our people, find your phonetic translation and trademark that fast. Experts agree. There are experts who agree with us. Mark Jacobs says when you're talking about fashion, lose the word original. Ask any designer where they get their inspiration. They don't sit by a window and let it materialize. It's all about research. And Coco Chanel being copied is the ransom of success. That's the background. So we welcome the discussion, and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. So I know that um, usually we wait to the end for questions, but I actually think in the room this size, it would be great to have people come up during a discussion or raise your hand or just let me know that you have a question so that this is more of a discussion um, and as interactive and engaging as possible. So if you have a question, just let us know. Um, I want to start off talking a little bit about, um, between our two presentations, we've talked a lot about why copyright is um, not necessarily a great um, form of protection for fashion. Is there, um, are there circumstances where um, we need more protection for Fashion design, and what would those be? You want me to take that? Sure, whatever. No. <laughs> uh, in the world of copyright, original art is and should be copied. But there needs to be a major change in the copyright office, and, and they do agree with us, um, that there needs to be a clearer definition of what is original art. Putting a um, stem on a daisy and being able to declare that as an original copyright print should not be allowed. At this point, the Copyright Office, you send in your artwork, whether it's on the back of your jean or on a print, with $35 to the Copyright Office, and you get a copyright. There is no listing. There is no visual record. No one knows who came before. And in the case of two copyrights, it's the first postmark, first to file. So those changes have to be made, but should there be any more, or should there be copyright or design restrictions on garments? Not if it's based for consumer public, consumer con, uh, consumption. Yeah, and this is the, the thing that really gets me, is that I 
I can see the perspective of you know, fashion designers wanting more protection because there's just that visceral gut reaction of when you pour your heart and soul into this you know, beautiful design and then you see it on the rack set forever 21 for 10 bucks, you know, that sucks. <laughs> and I can understand that. But at the same time, you can copyright a textile. You can copyright your print that you're putting on to a piece of fabric. That is copyrightable. And that's that's not questionable. Like Forever 21 does copy your beautiful, very original print design that you put onto a fabric. That's copyright violation. If it is a straight counterfeit, you also have protection. So, and not to mention that Honestly, the person who's going to buy the $10 garment at Forever 21 never would have bought Bo Peace. <laughs> and that's, that's the difficulty that I run into is that I can understand the visceral reaction to wanting more protection, but I just see so many, so much collateral damage that we're very well intentioned, well meaning designers don't realize that they're doing, that they would be doing to themselves. So um, there's, there's been this idea that um, the, the lack of copyright and the proliferation of knockoffs actually helps the fashion industry as a whole because it accelerates those, um, the cycle of obsolescence and forces, you know, in a strange way, um, the origins of copyright in the U.S. were meant to um, inspire creativity, to um, give ownership over design, to um, motivate um, artists to continue to create and benefit from those creations. And in fashion, it works the opposite, right? So there's no copyright, so the design that you've made within a matter of weeks or months is already obsolete, which forces this increased cycle of um, innovation. Is there, um, is there any other industry that we can see that um, or any other situation where you can see that um, dynamic working? Food. Comedy. Pardon? Mm -hmm. Comedy. Comedy? Yeah. yeah. When something becomes in style or out of style, and that's in the food industry, that's in uh, the restaurant industry, suddenly Southwestern is in, suddenly uh, Asian fusion is in, suddenly something else, and then it's out. Um, what, what we always say to the designers who bemoan the fact that it's in, and it's interesting that everybody talks about Forever 21 because H&M, Zara, Mango, Benelton, they're all in this, but why are we always picking on the American retailers? Uh, and besides, Macy's and JCPenney do it too, and Target. But, but, the, but the issue is a designer makes 75, 50 to 75, garments a season every 10 weeks to be in front of the buying public, the, the retail buying public. And if one of them is knocked off, there's a hue and a cry, does that mean that that designer is not very good? I mean, if your whole line is knocked off, then you have, then you have an opportunity to say piracy. It's a whole other issue. But if one out of a hundred is knocked off, First of all, as a designer, you should own it. Own that knockoff, as just Square said. Own the fact that somebody found something in you that was worthy of trend development, and maybe they'll come back. But if only one out of a hundred is not, well, you're not a very good designer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm curious because I believe fashion design. Please, please come to the mic. So that I think the web people want to be able to hear you and see where the mic is. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious about the fashion design industry because I think between the U.S. industry and the French industry, what copyright is doing. And also, I'm curious if any American designers have ever sued in France trying to take protection of the French law. Let me give you an answer to both of those. The European law has two things that is not in this law. One is registration. It's called an RCD, Registered Design Copyright, RDC. 
and not copyright, registered certificate. So if you want to register your design, you can register it. Usually they don't. It doesn't cost any people. And the other thing is loser pays. That's the third rail of American law. Loser pays. If we had loser pays, we'd be all for this bill. Because anyone who sues on originality of design would lose. So that's the main big difference between the European law and our law. There was a major fight in the 70s and early 80s between Ralph Lauren and, um, again, Yves Saint Laurent. Yves Saint Laurent said they did the smoking, the black tuxedo, the black tuxedo jacket with pants. It was called the smoking. Sued Ralph Lauren for doing a line-for-line -line copy in his New York show, won in the French court. Ralph Lauren then countersued in the U.S. and won in the U.S. court. Okay? And we at the same time in the 80s, because I did this in front of a, a major group of, of students, showed Marlena Dietrich in the same outfit in 1936. Okay? So nothing is new, and yet, but very rarely, very rarely do these lawsuits proliferate in Europe on fashion because it comes and goes there as well. And my understanding with the law in France is also that there's a higher standard for a certificate to be accepted. Um, and a lot of designers in France actually ignore the law. They don't register. It's not used. Uh, given the fact that the fashion industry is very profitable and there's a lot of money being made, aren't these basically ego lawsuits or ego laws to try to basically protect the ego of, of you know, designers, certain designers, who don't really want to compete in a, in a environment that they know certainly exactly what the environment is before they enter into it. And, and the fact that you have uh, designers like Calvin Klein, who probably makes more money off of underwear than he does on any, quote, high fashion, because he understood the economics is that everybody's going to buy underwear. So if I can get 50 cents or a dollar 50 more on a pack of underwear, then you know, I could care less what I make on a runway in France. Well, basically, the money in the business is based on the value of your trademark. So it's not based on the value of your copyrights, because your copyrights are only worth 10 weeks, really. I mean, no one, no one really is living in a print for three years. But trademark is the thing. Calvin Klein has been out of the business for seven years. And he's making his money on his licensing of his trademark. And that could be undershirts or underwear or whatever it is. And that's what everybody's going for, to make the value of their mark more exclusive, better. Um, I won't speak to the egos of the people involved, but you're right. <laughs> hey, Blake Reed from the Institute for Public Representation at Georgetown. Um, I wanted to tee up the, what something you just talked about with that. With tra it sounds like trademark law and other types of laws, maybe trade dress and, and other things, might end up being really important in, in terms of uh, uh, your success in the fashion industry. Um, but at the, the same token, we've been talking today about norms governing at behavior in a lot of these industries. So we talked this morning um, about uh, journalists not being willing to do things that might upset their colleagues. Um, I mentioned comedy a minute ago. There's a famous uh, Joe Rogan calling out Carlos Mencia for stealing everybody's jokes. So you stop telling your jokes when Robin Williams comes in, into the room. Uh, my mom is a big quilter, and the, the quilters have these elaborate series of norms about what you're able to copy and what you're not that really have nothing to do with copyright law, but might mirror it in some ways. So I was wondering if you could talk about uh, sort of the need for law to play a role and the need for norms and, and, and how you see that shaking out in the fashion industry. So I, I, it's, um, that was, um, I'm glad you brought this up because um, when we were doing our research, that was um, a large part of it. It was the idea that in the absence of copyright maximalism, um, how effective is self-regulation and um, shame as a um, motivator 
Um, you know, we saw in the case of Balenciaga, there wasn't much shame there, even though he was called out on it, and even though um, the industry as a whole said, this isn't right, you know, you need, you need to give credit where credit is due. It wasn't so much the copying as the fact that he did it without, he got caught, you know, he, he thought he would get away with it, and um, he didn't. Um, so what we found in the course of doing our research was that um, there is nothing new under the sun, but there are um, certain um, patterns or um, uh, designs that are very much associated with particular designers. So Rudy Gernreich, um, uh, who did a, a plaid, correct? Um, was it? Or um, the uh, Christian Dior um, peplum. You know, the, the idea that um, you can you can knock something off. You can pay homage as long as you give credit where credit is due. And if you don't do that, that's when that self-regulating shame kicks in, where the rest of the industry says, "No, this is not right. You need to you need to at least acknowledge where this came from." Um, so even though attribution isn't part of the copyright law or trademark law or anything like that, you, you wouldn't need to reference the person. You could yeah, it becomes, it becomes a self-regulating. Uh, mechanism within that industry. But. Um, unless you're not allowed to. Chanel, uh, twice a year, takes out a full page ad in Women's Wear Daily and said, we do not allow even the use of the name. Like, you can't say Chanel like jacket in a newspaper, magazine, anywhere. We love our brand and we appreciate that you love it too, but don't use it. We're coming after you. So you can take trademark all the way. You can let it proliferate. There's a great story that I happen to be privy to. Uh, I was in uh, uh, China, in Macau, and this is, um, they have a huge area where junk is all over the place. And Oshkosh, Bagosh, which was a Wisconsin company, was out of business for 10 years. And the biggest brand I saw in China in all the swap meets was Oshkosh. Certainly wasn't done by Wisconsin people, but it became so important in China that the company renewed itself in Wisconsin, the children of the original owners, and it's now a brand again. That's how strong a trademark can be when it's just permanently ingrained in brains and they look at it. And that is where we are right now with the internet, by the way. People are even knocking off American Apparel and Forever 21, just putting the labels in junk just so it has validity. Trademarks have become a valid exercise of, of cash. That's what the internet has done. And Be think, careful, you don't know what you're buying. And I think going back to the concept of egos, linking it with brand and then I'll, I'll let Michael answer the questions um, is that, <laughs> is that if I see a Chanel-like jacket, even if it's not Chanel and there's nothing written about it saying that it is Chanel-like, I'm still versed in the language of the fashion industry and I know it's a Chanel-inspired jacket. There's a sense that really you've become the most successful you can be in the fashion industry if you know when you can say, oh, this collection was clearly inspired by such and such, such and such and so and so, and you can, you can tell that, um, that, that really is more than any sort of trademark can offer and any sort of legal framework can apply or create to give that kind of value that the industry and the people who follow the industry really speak a language of brands that, not a trademark, but a brand, like a feel, something that feels like it's Chanel, or feels like it's Balenciaga, you know? That's why this Louboutin case is going to be such a classic case, because it totally counters what's going on right now with trademark. Louboutin's trademark is the red soul, <laughs> okay? Didn't trademark it. They tra ta tried to trademark it. But it's going counter to that right now. It's too, when we see somebody with a red sole shoe, we assume they spent $1,000 for that shoe. 
And at the same time, if I were to see a shoe with a red sole on it in a department store, and it wasn't Louboutin, I would go, that's trashy. I'm not going to buy that. That's a, that's a knockoff. I mean, it's self-regulating. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, you know, and we, we think of fashion as sort of a low IP industry, and we sort of, over the course of this hour, we've been examining the fact that there's a lot of IP in fashion, even though it's a comparatively low IP industry. But I wonder if there are lessons that can be learned from other industries. And this is, we're talking about regulation through a combination of law and, and culture or societal norms or whatever we want it to call it. Is there something unique about the fashion industry that allows it to function this way? Or is this something that would be possible in other industries, but for the existing legal structure? Is this exportable beyond fashion industry, or is fashion a fluke? I'm going to take this one. OK. So um, when we wrote, when we were doing our research, it was a comparison to music and fashion. And uh, the bottom line is that um, fashion as a physical good is, um, if I'm wearing a hat, you can't wear that same hat. <laughs> Whereas music is, um, went from being a physical good, uh, it went from being uh, rival and excludable to non-rival and not excludable. So um, if I'm listening to a particular song, it used to be, I was listening to this record, you had to be right next to me and listen to that same exact record. Once everything went digital, that flies out the window, um, which is why the music industry is in such a jam right now when it comes to copyright maximalism. Um, if I'm wearing this jacket, you can't wear the same jacket at the same time. Um, and that's, that's where there's that break. Um, I mean, there's, both of those industries have very different organizational, legal, and social structures. But at the end of the day, a physical good versus a virtual good make it very, very difficult to take lessons from the world of fashion and import them directly into the world of music or movies um, or, or anything that has Essentially, become virtual or digital. Um, I wish there was a. I wish there was a better answer to that. Um, maybe you have one, but well, I, I, one of the things is diversity. Mm -hmm. um, there is no more diverse industry of designers than in the world of consumer products. Our industry alone in um, in California, you'd have to translate everything into seven languages from Farsi to Korean to Chinese to Japanese to bad English to Spanish. <laughs> um, but uh, it is, there's such a diverse amount of designers and, and consumers of fashion that, there are, that there's really no way to say what is the moral path for one because they take from each other. What is in the Latino community on the salsa dance floors is certainly not in the Korean community where one size fits all. So it's, it's so diverse that it is uh, a problematic situation to say, you can't copy me because I'm going for a different customer. I mean, you know, I think the issue of, um, is the person buying the, the Forever 21 jacket for ten dollars the same person who's going to buy a Chanel jacket for a thousand dollars and uh, four thousand dollars. So it, you know we're talking about um, it's not the same customer. Um, music, movies, video games, it probably is the same customer. Um, the um, you know we're also talking about within you know, media an oligopoly. Um, you know, a few highly concentrated companies um, in charge of, you know, the vast majority of production and revenue. And the fashion industry is not like that. It is highly stratified and highly diverse. Um, and a low threshold for entry. Um, Could be the back of your garage. Well, now media has a pretty low threshold for entry as well. Yeah. It's far more democratized today than it was um, a long time ago, or not even that long ago. Um, but um, you know, and, you know, when we when we set out to do our research, our question was: Are there lessons that those industries can take from fashion? And um, it's a very very difficult question to answer. Um, you know, we think that there's uh, a lot to be learned from fashion in terms of 
um, creating an industry and a community, again, two separate things that are um, <laughs> regulated, um, essentially self-regulated through this mechanism of shame or norms. Um, but, um, and there is, there probably um, are parallels within music. You, you know, you, you have to give credit um, where credit is due in terms of sampling or um, borrowing um, certain ideas or certain drum lines or certain bass lines, um, certain harmonies and certain melodies. We tend to protect those actually more than rhythm. We protect the harmony more than we protect the rhythm. Um, but, you know, I, I um, it, it always came down to the fact that what is a physical good and what is a non physical good has very different um, ways of protecting themselves. And I think um, the way that knowing the background in Michael's head, having worked with him, um, I think that the way this can be applied is with thinking about other industries that don't already have copyright or that have less IP. I think that, especially in Washington, and especially the reason why we're all gathered here today is to remember the limits and exceptions on copyright, is that sometimes there are industries where no copyright is not a big scary thing. Um, and I think that there's a tendency to see more copyright is always better, um, more copyright enforcement is always better. You know, that's, that's the conversation that we're used to having, but we need to start also having a conversation about copyright period sometimes it's not the answer to everyone's problems and can sometimes cause a lot more damage in the industry. And I think that, that copyright or copyright in fashion is one of the prime examples because it is such a rich and diverse and successful and you know, multi-billion dollar industry that drives such a huge portion of the economy and is not, does not have copyright. And I think that that lesson is, is the main one in terms of your question. I think we're done with questions. Or any last ones? No. Um, I want to thank our panelists, Vanya Ray and Katie, especially for stepping in um, for Nora and couldn't be here today due to illness, and for Ilsa coming all the way from Los Angeles, like me. <laughs> <laughs>